The ancient philosopher Cicero said gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all virtues. I'd like to take his idea from the personal realm to the public realm and say that consent is not only the greatest virtue of a civilized society, but the parent of them all. You see, without consent, there is no civilized society. Without consent, there is no rule of law. Ironically, most people today are not 100% sure what consent really means, or they consciously choose to disregard it. Most of the world associates the word consent with sexual consent. Well, I'm here today to help set the record straight on what consent really is and how it interplays in all aspects of our day-to-day -day lives, from birth to death. So what exactly is consent? Consent can be interchanged with the word permission, but a more formal definition is a voluntary agreement made without coercion between persons with decision-making capacity, knowledge, understanding, and autonomy. You can ask for consent to do something to or with someone, and you can give or not give consent to have something done to you or with you. It is essentially the granting of or the denying of something, and in the context that I'm gonna talk about today, it has to do with bodies and boundaries. Now, all of this sounds pretty straightforward, right? Well, if that were true, we wouldn't have a Me Too movement right now. But because we're not taught consent and boundaries from a young age, and are dramatically influenced by things like media, culture, religion, and other elements in our life, the concept of consent and boundaries is a bit blurry. For most, it can seem confusing and even daunting. Consent can be complex. So to better understand how to practice consent, we have to understand its root. It starts with the fact that you have the right to grant or deny that permission or consent. That right is also known as bodily autonomy. It is foundational and at the heart of consent. In order to understand what consent really is, we have to understand and agree that bodily autonomy is and should be an inalienable right. But you're not born with this understanding. You must be educated about the fact that you even have this right. And then you have to be given ample opportunity to practice that right. Although you may be able to grant or not grant consent, you still need to determine what you're okay or not okay granting consent to. This is also known as developing our boundaries. We start to figure out our boundaries when we're kids and continue doing so through adolescence and adulthood. Determining our boundaries is an ongoing and fluid process. Our boundaries can change. I also want to add that if as kids we weren't allowed to have any or many boundaries or worse, your boundaries were violated, then you can start to see how all of this can get muddy. But let's say that you were educated about your body rights and boundaries. You can then begin to express them through language, be it body language, facial cues, or through spoken word. I would love that, or please don't touch me like that. Ideally, we also learn that not only should others ask for our consent and respect the answer, but that it's a two-way street, and we must also respect the autonomy and boundaries of others. Learning all of this is critical to our ability to engage in the world with less conflict and have positive and healthy relationships. It helps us to have more peaceful cooperation and have more enjoyable experiences in life. It's a simple three-step equation, autonomy, boundaries, and consent. So why don't adults know how to do this better? Why is there still so much confusion 
about consent? Well, let's look at how historically consent has been viewed and why consent is still such a complicated and new concept for most people. It starts with the fact that his, for most of history, people, and more so children, were not considered to have many rights, which meant very little body autonomy. In a world where slave labor once legally existed and tragically still exists underground in the form of human trafficking, where not that long ago women didn't have the right to vote, and where child marriage still exists in many parts of the world today, North America included, you can see that body autonomy and consent have not been high on the list of societal priorities. So to give you some context on this, here's a fact that you may not know. It wasn't until 1924 that the League of Nations adopted the Geneva Declaration on the Rights of the Child. This was the first time that children's rights were formally acknowledged in Western culture. You might be surprised that this didn't happen until 1924. That's less than 100 years ago. That's only a few generations ago. And it's important to note this because it takes time for people to make social and cultural changes. This means that we must do everything we can to get up to speed with the Geneva Declaration. We have a lot of catching up to do as it relates to children's rights and respecting them. And most importantly, for us to understand why this matters so much for us as a society. To help you see how all of this connects, I wanna share the stories of two girls, Cindy and Jennifer. Cindy grew up in a home where she was taught that her boundaries and body belonged to her and that she had a right to the boundaries that she had. Now, understanding that health and safety aren't exactly a toddler's priorities, Cindy's parents would sometimes have to override her boundaries. For example, when she wanted to run across the street, they couldn't let her do that. But wanting to help her understand about her body autonomy, she was always given a choice to either hold their hands or be carried across the street. Outside of health and safety, Cindy was never forced to hug or kiss anyone and she could offer a high five or a fist bump or just wave. And that went for adults, elders, or kids. Her parents asked grandma and grandpa not to guilt Cindy into affection with things like, I'll be so sad if you don't give me a hug, or to make her feel bad if she said no to their affection. They wanted Cindy to know that coercive and manipulative behavior was never okay, and that true consent must be given freely. She was also taught that consent can be withdrawn at any time, meaning that just because she said no, at, she said yes at one moment, didn't mean that that yes applied five minutes later, and that people should check in, and that if she changed her mind, that it was okay. Cindy was given plenty of opportunity to practice using her voice and speak up if she ever felt uncomfortable about any physical touch. She also learned to ask others for consent, and this was particularly helpful with reducing the number of fights with siblings. Now, let's talk about Jennifer. Jennifer was not given the ability to be taught about body autonomy and boundaries, and the concept of boundaries was never explicitly explained. Her parents thought that refusing to hug or kiss relatives was considered rude, because kids should respect the, their elders, and how she felt about it didn't matter. She just had to comply. Jennifer learned that her body was not always her own, and that it was to serve the societal expectations of others. And that saying no to affection could make someone sad or mad. And that it was better to just appease them despite her own discomfort. Jennifer was never given the ability to practice setting boundaries. 
When Jennifer was four and wanted to run across the street like most four-year-olds want to do, she was either just grabbed by the hand or scooped up, most times kicking and screaming. Her parents never gave her a choice. They just physically handled her without much communication. Jennifer learned that obedience and compliance were what mattered most to the people she loved. Not learning about body autonomy and boundaries meant that she also unintentionally crossed the boundaries of others, which caused a lot of problems between siblings, cousins, friends, or peers at school. It created a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication. Now, let's go back to Cindy. Cindy became a teenager. She started dating and she felt comfortable communicating her boundaries. She could more easily spot manipulative behavior and cut ties with toxic friends, which even helped reduce the risk of being in abusive romantic relationships or falling into dangerous peer pressure situations. If she ever felt unsafe or uncomfortable with someone and she couldn't speak up at the moment, she knew that she could ask for help. For example, when her English teacher would rub her shoulder every time he passed by her desk when she was taking a test, there was something about it that just didn't feel right. But because she knew that she had the right to her physical boundaries, she felt safe telling her parents, despite her teacher's position of power and authority. Cindy knew that they would speak up for her and help her. Unfortunately for Jennifer, her teen years were fraught with boundary crossings and flat out boundary violations. Because Jennifer didn't recognize red flag coercive behavior for what it was, she found herself in many unsafe situations. If Jennifer ever thought to herself, I said yes, but I don't really wanna do this, she didn't know that she could change her mind, so she went along with it unconsensually. Remember, she hadn't been taught that consent could be withdrawn at any time. The lessons she learned from her grandparents of, I'll be so sad if you don't give me a hug, which were reinforced by her parents, now translated to romantic partners who would say, if you love me, you'll have sex with me and being guilted and coerced into such activities. Jennifer also had that same English teacher. Remember that guy? Well, he realized that Jennifer didn't say anything and she just looked uncomfortable and shy. And so the touching escalated. Jennifer didn't know what to do or how to ask for help. Now, let's go back to Cindy. Cindy became a young adult who took all the lessons she learned from her life into her now personal and professional life. She quickly distanced herself from people who consistently crossed or intentionally overstepped boundaries. The lessons she learned helped her find a partner whom she connected with, who valued her and respected her boundaries. They started a family, and it was important for her to raise her boys the way she was raised and make sure that not only could she do everything to prevent abuse, but that also they learned how to respect the rights of others and not become abusers themselves. Professionally, Cindy was able to set healthy work boundaries. And when a coworker did unwanted advances, she was able to speak up, much like she had with that English teacher. Cindy understood that regardless of that person's position of power, she had grounds to report inappropriate behavior. She knew that she could count on people that would help her advocate for her rights. For Jennifer, as you can imagine by now, well, she continued struggling with boundary setting as an adult each situation adding more layers of trauma and confusion to her story. She would find herself in many unsatisfying relationships where her boundaries were rarely respected. When she started a family, she raised her kids the same way that she was raised. When her in-laws came over, 
Despite seeing how uncomfortable her kids were when Grandpa just went in for a tickle, she didn't know what to do or what to say. She was afraid of upsetting her elders or her partner if she tried to set boundaries for her kids. Jennifer felt anxious and unsure about how to teach her kids about body safety and abuse prevention. At work, she would occasionally deal with harassment by coworkers or bosses that saw her as an easy target. She would just grin, bear it, and hope that it wouldn't escalate. Sometimes it did escalate, and she would quit instead of reporting it because she feared the repercussions. Other times, it didn't escalate, but it would just become an annoyance that she felt she had to deal with. It made for an unpleasant work environment. Now, I want to be crystal clear. None of the boundary violations that Jennifer experienced were Jennifer's fault. They were solely the fault of the person violating the boundary. But if we taught consent from a very young age, we would have far fewer offenders. So now that you've heard two examples of how teaching consent and not teaching consent can impact the life of a child who becomes a teen, who becomes an adult in the world, I invite you to reflect on how consent plays a role in your day-to-day -day lives. Whether you're a parent, caregiver, grandparent, sibling, or an aunt, uncle, teacher, or coach, you have the power to impact the life of a child in powerfully positive ways. If we shift to a culture of consent, we can help prevent things like bullying, cyberbullying, workplace harassment, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, elder abuse, and the global epidemic of the silent scourge of child sexual abuse. We can create a safer world for everyone. So how can you make a difference? How can you be that change? Well, I have three ways you can start today, especially and particularly if you have young people in your life. One, respect the body rights of kids. Start making this change now. Start wherever you're at. Explain the concept of body autonomy, boundaries, and consent to the young people in your life and that you will begin practicing that with them. If you are not a parent, start practicing asking for consent for even the most basic things like hugs and kisses. And if you're a hugger, this isn't to say stop hugging, but just ask first and respect the answer for kids and adults. Two, educate yourself about how to develop, set, and uphold your own boundaries. Getting better at setting and upholding your boundaries will not only improve your life and relationships, but it is a powerful model for the young people in your life. If you're a parent, stand up for your child's boundaries. Remind adults that they are not entitled to a child's affection or their bodies. Get comfortable with uncomfortable conversations. And three, call out media that normalizes non-consensual interactions. Talk about it on social media and call out the producers of that content, be it big Hollywood movies, TV shows, ads, lyrics of songs, or your favorite YouTuber. Open up discussions on why that movie scene, lyric, or ad was wrong and what could have been done or said differently. Develop your courage muscles to change the narrative in your culture about consent. You are the ones that can empower this generation and generations to come to live in a safer, more peaceful society because as I said at the start, consent is not only the greatest virtue of a civilized society, but the parent of them all. Thank you.